Um, okay, so are there any questions about any of the homework problems or haven't looked at it yet? No. Okay, so uh, we started talking about number systems last time, and I'm going to continue that today. Um, you won't find, I don't think there's there's any coverage of tens complement um, in the textbook, but you know I, I, I usually I talk about that because it's easy to understand. We're, we're familiar with base ten arithmetic, and, it, and it's how you can use this complement representation um, to actually do subtraction by addition. So uh, you know. We can represent negative numbers and this uh, negative values in this uh, in this uh, complement representation using positive numbers. If you recall, we worked with four-digit tens complement, and anything any number in the range from five thousand to nine 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 actually represented a negative number, and the numbers between zero and four thousand nine hundred ninety-nine actually represented the corresponding positive numbers. So it essentially took that range of zero, 10,000 numbers, zero to 9999, and essentially half of them are positive, and then the other half are negative. But with that representation, uh, representing negative numbers as those positive values, it also has this other advantage that you know you just do addition like we do normal base kind of uh, uh, arithmetic addition. And everything just magically works out because of that complement representation. You add a positive and a negative number, you get the right value. You add two negative numbers, you get the right value. If you want to subtract, just take the tens complement and add. Take the tens complement of the second number. That's all you have to do is take the tens complement of the second number and then add the two numbers and you get the right result. So we don't need special subtraction circuitry. That's, that's the big advantage of this complement arithmetic. I think you guys are all familiar with, uh, with two's complement arithmetic. We essentially subtract the value for an n bit, if, we have an, uh, if we're using n bit numbers to store a negative value, you actually just subtract the value from two to the n. So for, and I use 8-bit number and, uh, representations here because they're easy to work with on the board. But far more common is working with 32-bit numbers or 64-bit numbers on your microcontrollers. But you just subtract the value from 2 to the n, like we were subtracting from 10,000 for an 8-bit 2's complement if you want to represent minus 100. Uh, so, for example, let me write down uh, first plus 100. And how that would be represented as, as an 8-bit number. I'm going to leave space in here for um, the ones comp. And then the, the twos complement representation. Since this is a positive value, you know, it's just the standard 8-bit binary representation. No 128, we have 164, we have 132, right? So that gives me, is that 96? So I need four more. Zero, one, oh, oh. Is that right? Is that the binary representation of in base two? So, um, To represent minus 100, we want to subtract the positive 100 from one zero zero one followed by eight zeros. And I think I showed this last time that you know essentially doing that subtracting. It's actually easier to write that large number down as you know all ones plus one, right? Except eight ones plus one. Uh, 
I do this subtraction. I don't know if I can even do it right. But I have to subtract one here. This would give me zero. So this would be one, one, zero, zero, one. I think, of, I think maybe I've done that right. We'll, just, we'll see. Instead of doing that, though, the, the other way to do it is actually subtract it from one number less. But here, subtraction's easy. That's and then add one to that. Because this, one followed by eight, no, eight zeros, is eight ones plus one, right? So I'll just subtract from this and then add one. So zero, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one. Did I get the same value? I didn't. I screwed up somewhere. I, I'm going to show you that one's right. Is that right? Or did I mess this one up? Here? Not at the top. Like, yeah, right there, right where your fingers are. One, zero, carry one. Subtract one, one, zero. Is that not right? I think that's right. Anyway, this, this, this is the right twos complement representation. Uh, I think I did that subtraction wrong. I'm not quite sure where the error is, but that's the right twos complement representation. So it's, it's pretty easy to get the, the twos complement, except here I've got, no, that's fine. So to, to get the twos complement representation of plus 100, we take the ones comp, which if you notice, subtracting from this is just flipping every bit, right? That subtraction is just flipping every bit. So you don't actually have to do a subtraction. I just invert every bit. So inverting this, I have one, zero, zero, one, one, zero, one, one. And then now I add one. Now I'll get one, one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one. And so this would be, the two's complement representation of minus 100. And in the two's complement representation, you, you can know easily if, if, the, if the number represents a negative value. If that leading digit is one, it represents a negative value. That's all you have to look at. If it's zero, we know it represents a positive value. Now, if I add these two, I should get zero again. I'm adding minus 100 and plus 100. I get zero, zero, zero carry one, zero carry one, zero carry one, zero carry one, and zero carry one. Remember, I ignore any carries out of that final place. That's actually this one followed by eight zeros up here again. Okay, so I just ignore that additional one and I get zeros. Okay, so and it's 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 greatly simplifies the design of my microprocessor, the mathematical circuitry. I don't need special subtraction circuitry with this two's complement representation. Um, okay, so you can. It is really up to you whether you want to use. n bits, an 8-bit number, to hold unsigned values or signed values. So the unsigned range is 0 to 2 to the n minus 1. The sign, if you use some, the signed range, it's minus 2 to the n minus 1 up to plus 2 to the n minus 1 minus 1. Okay. So if you use 8 bits to represent unsigned values, the range is 0 to 255. Right? 
256 things we can represent with an 8-bit number, 2 to the 8th. The range, though, since we include, it's, you know, it's not 1 to 256, since we start at 0, it's 0 to 255. The signed representation is actually minus 128 to plus 127. We get one more negative number in the two's complement representation, then we get positive numbers, and that's because zero is there. We've got zero to 127, that's 128 values, and we've got minus one to minus 128, that's another 128, so it's 256 total. Now, again, using 8-bit numbers, certainly in programs you might write in C, uh, is um, rare. Okay, uh, typically uh, you would use ENTS, which are 32 bits. A little more common working with different size integer representations when you're working with a microcontroller. So pull out your calculators and figure out the corresponding ranges for 16 and 32. So what's the range here for a 16-bit number? How many different? What's what's the range if you're if you're using a 16-bit number to represent unsigned values? And then so so here it's actually going to be. You can get, it's going to be minus 60, oops, no, it's half that. Uh, what is that, minus 30, 32, 768 to 32, 767. And then, I'll show you a little trick to pressure significant other. Um, two to the 10th. Is you know what two to the tenth? You know what two to the eighth is, right? We looked at that. How what, what how many how many things can you represent? What's two to the eighth equal to? Two fifty six. If you're going to be an engineer, you know that two to the eighth is two fifty six. Um, two to the tenth is what? Ten twenty four. Be two to the eighth times two times two, so five twelve ten twenty four. But it's roughly a thousand. And that's easy to remember. Two to the tenth is roughly a thousand. So two to the thirtieth would be a thousand times a thousand times a thousand, right? So how much is that? That's a million. Thirty-two bits, though. You got two more bits, which is four, right? You got two to the thirtieth times two squared, which is four. So with thirty-two bits, you can roughly represent four million things. With 16 bits, you've got 
2 to the 10th times 2 to the 6. What's 2 to the 6? Yeah, you might have to divide back. 2 to the 5th is 32. Somehow I, that's stuck in my head. So 2 to the 6th is 64. So 2 to the 16th is 64 times 2 to the 10th. It's roughly 64,000. So this goes roughly to 64,000. This goes roughly to the 4 million. So what is it? Did you what is it exactly? Um, Two to the thirty-two minus one. Four million two hundred ninety-four thousand nine hundred sixty-seven. Okay. And so this will be minus four two nine four nine six. Oh no, it won't. It's two million. It's half that. Uh, so what is this? I could do half that, but it's too hard. Uh, two, one, uh, I'm sorry, go there. What is it? And 183. 183? 483. Okay, it should be I think. four. All right, it's yeah. got to be even. Okay, two, two million, one, four, seven. That, uh, also, sorry, I messed with it. That's nine six uh, eight. Yeah. I think at the end of the second one. No, one one sorry. At the end of unsigned, unsigned, unsigned. Zero nine eight. Yeah. Nine six eight. It should be odd. Oh, that one. Yeah, because it's to the end, which is always even minus one. Oh, okay. So, yeah. so nine six nine six seven. Yeah. Okay, I'm not going to do sixty four. Uh, sixty four bits. So, but uh, what would that be? Sixty four bits, two to the sixtieth. That's a thousand to the sixth power, right? So that's that's a one with. You know, uh, Three zeros, 18 zeros, and then um, six, then four more, two to the fourth is eight. That, that's a gig, gig, <laughs> gigantic number, right? The 64 bits, you know, I, I think I've been told that you, know, it, it, you can calculate every atom in the known universe with a 64 bit number. It's not twice. A 32 bit number is the 32 bit number squared. 2 to the 32 squared is 64. 64 bit numbers are incredibly large. Okay, the, the range of them, I mean, it would take me a while just to write down the range of the 64 bit number. You, will your calculators even handle it? 2 to the 64th, it gives you some floating point representation. What is it? Um, it's too big to say out loud. Times 10 to the what, though? No, it's like it's finding the orbital up. Okay, okay. 10 to the 19. 10 to the 19. We said roughly 10 to the 18, right? So uh, times um, whatever. Um, now, in C, data types are used um, to keep track of the size of the number and also the range. So you get these different data types. And you can choose when you declare the variable to make it either a signed type or unsigned type. Okay. And probably almost always you've just done the, the signed type. But eight and then char and then Unsigned char. Now, without the unsigned, it's assumed to be char. So, char by itself can represent values from minus 128 to plus 127. Unsigned char would be 0 to 255. And then 16 would be short. And then you have the corresponding unsigned short.
and 32 is int, and then unsigned int. I think 64 is long, long. One of the problems with C, the original C specification, is that this is typically what's true, but in the, in the C language, it actually only specifies that a short has to be at least as large as a char, and an int has to be at least as large as a short. So on, on some microprocessors, an int is actually only 16 bits, and a long then might be 32. There is no, unfortunately, there is no standard sizes for these data types. But when you declare the variables, you get to choose, you know, whether it's signed or unsigned. Typically, we just use the signed types, but you know, it depends really on what, what you want to do, what, what you're counting. So that was rectified a little bit in, in a, a subsequent standard called the C99 standard, which came out in 1999. So it's been around for a while. So in C99, we do, you can still use these data types. But if you really need control over the size, the range of the variable, they've got these new types called int eight. And then the underscore T means that this is this is a data type. And then for unsigned, it's u int eight underscore t. So this is guaranteed to be an 8-bit representation. So with modern C compilers, all C compilers that you would be using, then you, you could use these. Similarly, we've got int 16, u int 16, um, 32, 64. I'm not going to write them all down. You went 64. T, you should see the pattern at this point. And then a char should actually be used just to represent characters. And then you can use these data types. And then this is, the use of these is a little bit more common in microcontrollers where you have, where you, you, you know exactly the size of a, a register you want to write to, value you might want to write to a particular register, that it's an 8-bit, it holds an 8-bit value, or that it holds a 16-bit value. Now, in assembly, we're also going to be doing some assembly language programming. In assembly, it's left up to the, uh, the programmer to keep track of these. Um, and, and when you're programming C, the, the language itself, you get to define the data variable. <laughs> but in, in assembly, if you've got an 8 bit value, it's up to you whether you interpret something with a leading with a one in that most significant bit as an unsigned value representing maybe 250 or whether it's a negative six or something. If it's a signed value, you have to keep track. Okay. Um, if you got your book, turn to page uh, 29 in your book. There's a table there, it's called the ASCII code table. Um, ASCII is a, a seven bit code, but we store it in eight bit and an eight bit byte. And it's commonly, it's commonly used, especially with microcontrollers here in the US and devices we interface to. Um, and this is the code that's commonly used to represent characters in the English alphabet, okay, this, this ASCII code. So, what, you can do something like this. I could define a hexadecimal value to the variable C. That's, that's in the ASCII code, the eighth bit is um, zero. Okay, we just use the first seven bits and then eight bit is zero. So they'll all fit into assigned representations. So what, what's a, what letter does the, the hexadecimal 47 represent? 
Can you figure it out from that table? I think the table's laid out a little bit awkwardly. G. G? Everyone agrees it's G? I think that's right. Is it uppercase or lowercase G? Uppercase G, so you notice it's got representations for both. Okay, so internally, well, this could represent what's the corresponding binary value. So this, this hexadecimal um, uh, uh, 4 sixteens is 128. Uh, so, no. Did I say that right? Four. The four sixteens. What's this in what's this as the decimal value? We'll do that on your calculator. It would be four sixteens. You convert that on your calculator. Now you your calculator to convert that. What, what is that decimal number? 71. 71. So it's 71 as a, as a decimal value. How's it stored internally? It's stored as an 8 bit number. It's, it's stored in binary. That's how it's stored as an 8 bit value inside the computer. This is just convenient shorthand notation. I could also equivalently in, in C, it allows me to just do this. <coughs> the uppercase G. Okay. You, use, you can set it either way. This is convenient if you know if, if you know it represents a character value and you and you just want to encode it directly. Internally, C would be this binary pattern. Right. How it's interpreted externally when you go to print it is really up to you. It depends on how you want to display it. If you display it, this percent %D specifier means display it as a decimal number. In this case, it would display, we say 71. Yeah, four sixteen. I was saying four sixteen is sixty four plus seven seventy one. But if you displayed it as a character, what you would see on your terminal is the uppercase letter G. The terminal would receive this binary pattern, but the terminal expects ASCII characters. And so any binary patterns it, it receives, um, uh, it interprets as ASCII. What this does, it actually sends the ASCII code for seven followed by the ASCII code for one to your terminal so that the terminal displays 71. But internally, it's, you know, it's the same representation how it's translated for us humans to interpret depends on you know how you choose to interpret it here now the ascii representation is still fairly common especially with microcontrollers but in programming languages um, what's known as unicode is becoming more common the Unicode is, is at least 16 bits. It's actually it's a variable length code. But Unicode is designed to actually have a representation for every character in every alphabet and every language. And there, instead of using char, you use wide char, W-C-H-A-R is the corresponding data type in, in C. Again, we won't deal much with that in this class with the 
the microcontrollers and the little display device that we use expects things in, in ASCII code. But certainly for, if you're writing per, uh, applications for computers um, and you want them to be, you want an international audience, you want to be able to display uh, messages in any language, you're probably going to use a Unicode representation for, for your characters. Um, how are how are strings this, uh, stored internally in C? Now, I'm, I'm not talking about C++ where you've got a string type. How are, how are character, so this is to display just a single character. Do you recall how you, how you display a, how you store a string in C? An array of characters. It's an array of characters. And a string, and so okay. you would, in this case, you could print these out character by character. I could print string of zero using the percent C format specifier. If I did that, that would be what I'd find in there is the letter H. And when I mean that the letter H is stored in that location, I mean the ASCII code for the uppercase letter H is stored at that byte location. And STR1, you find the E. Two, three, four. Is there anything in the in the fifth location? So if I if I the problem is you know I, I could display the, the string. Remember, this hello is just stored, again, it's the actual ASCII characters. These are just bytes in memory. This is the address of the first byte. Okay. So what this would do is start displaying the string. And it gets the address of the first character, and then it's just going to display characters. But at least in C, there's nothing associated with this character array that, that indicates the length of the string. So in C, the standard is you have to store a null byte, a zero byte, after the last character in the string. So when you set up this array like this, it actually sets aside six bytes of storage for STR. It actually goes from zero through five. There is an STR of five. Zero, one, two, three, four. STR five would actually be the value zero. So not, not the ASCII for the character zero, but an actual binary value of zero. All zeros, all eight bits would be zeros. And that indicates now that when we go to print this, so keep printing letters until it runs into that binary zero. There is no corresponding length associated with an array in C, unlike in C++ where you have objects and you, know, you have like string objects which have not only the, the underlying data, but there's also a length associated with it. So this is one way to actually uh, define define the array. We could do something like this. And then I could do this in subsequent lines. Now, if I went to print out at this point, since I haven't terminated this properly, what I see is A, B, and then possibly a bunch of garbage until I finally ran into a zero in memory. And that's when it would stop 
of printing. So I actually need to terminate. Like that. Just and, you know. So notice it. Here I, I ha actually have to set aside one more byte than actually the, the length of the string. If I do it this way, it automatically sets aside and storage for six bytes for me. So we'll play around with some of this and start program. Any questions? Unfortunately, I know a lot of you have come from different, I think the, the computer engineers all took CS210, which you do, you work primarily in C. Um, those of you in electrical engineering probably took engineering one, two, three, which you work uh, in uh, C sharp, which is a little different language, has different data types. Um, uh, in C sharp, you probably didn't, have never seen a printf used to display values. I assume in CST10, who are my computer engineers? You guys work with printf and scanf and CST10. Okay. Um, and engineering one, two, three, and, and C sharp, I don't know, it's, it's probably some sort of print, but uh, different data types. And I think it doesn't use a char array for a string. It has a string object type, I think. So things are a little different. Um, last thing I'm going to talk, talk on uh, briefly is just computer architecture. And I think you guys are familiar with this. You know, basic structure of a computer. The only difference between a, a microprocessor or, or a microcontroller uh, is a, a so you'll hear the term uh, computer, microprocessor, microcontroller. You know, a computer has a microprocessor and typically then separate memory on other boards inside the computer. A microcontroller will typically have the processor as well as all of the memory on the same processor board like the little microcontroller board that we have. And the microcontroller itself has a numeric processor and then all this additional memory built into and built into the chip itself. So we typically have you remember what RAM stands for? Random access memory and what does ROM stand for? read-only memory. Unfortunately, random access is it's not as meaningful as it once was because ROM is also random access. Random access just means that you could you can you know put an address out there and, and read the corresponding byte at that at that location. And instead of random access memory, the other type of memory they used to have is sequential access memory. To get to a particular byte, you'd have to read all the other bytes before that. So RAM is, is really not very, a very good descriptor anymore. Really could argue that ROM is not a very good descriptor anymore either because on our microcontrollers, our programs will be stored in ROM. Well, it can't be really just read-only memory because we have to write our programs to it, right? So um, it used to be that you had to use a special hardware to write to ROM and they could only be written once. But nowadays it's more common with microcontrollers to have what's called what's known as flash ROM, where you can transfer your program to the microcontroller. But then usually when you run your program, you know, you read instructions out of this flash ROM, out of this memory but you don't store data variables there. Any variables you read and write and you create in your program are all stored in RAM, but your program instructions are stored in ROM. So all of this would make up, you know, a computer or would all be part of a, a microcontroller. You communicate between these using different buses 
And typically there's an there's an address bus. Not typically, always, there's an address bus. So if a processor wants to read a particular value from RAM, you know, this RAM um, uh, memory at RAM corresponds to a particular set of set of addresses. Uh, let's say we've got um, a 16-bit address bus and a 16-bit data bus here. So this say so this sounds. So um, 16 bits, that's four hex characters. So maybe this is two zero x you know, one f f f. And this is zero x two zero zero two zero x three f f. These are address ranges. So if I want to write to a particular location in RAM from the processor, I put, you know, an address that's in this range, say 0x0123, zero zero that's in this address range. I put that address on the address bus. The RAM chip or integrated circuit recognizes that that's a RAM address so it knows to read the data, the processor would then, it's also connected to the data bus as it is RAM. So if we're doing a write, the, the RAM would know it needs to read that value off the data bus based on the address that's selected. Or similarly for a read, same address, but if I'm doing a read operation, now the RAM would dump its, put its data on the data bus, and that would be transferred into a processor register. There's a third address bus, or not address bus, but a bus that's used for control. It has these control signals that indicates whether I'm doing a read or a write. So these will all be connected to that as well. Now, in addition to that, um, we may want to be able to communicate with the outside world, okay, to other devices that are outside our microcontroller. So we've got things like keyboards, displays. We don't have a disk drive in here, okay. You know, certainly for, we, it's rare to have disk drives on microcontrollers, but certainly on computer systems, it's common to have disk drives. So they, there we have, um, these ports, input port, and output port. So an input port might be connected to something like a, a keyboard. And the port would have to be assigned a particular address as well. Okay, so something that's not in this range, maybe this is OX4100 for this input port that's connected to the keyboard. So when the mic, when the when we write a program that reads from this particular input port, we're going to read a character from the keyboard. And these would also be connected to. all of these buses. Something for the output port, we might have a terminal or some sort of graphics display. Um, a disk drive would actually be connected to both, right? We need to read from and write to a, a, a disk. Output port, sorry, to send stuff to the terminal. Um, any questions about this?
All right, that's it for today. See you on Wednesday. I'll post up the homework assignment today for today and, and just a few minutes as soon as I get up in my office. Thank you.